soul. Yep. Amen. I hope that's true of you. Yep. Now, brother mine, I need that, and I don't need that. So. <laughs> you need to join. He doesn't. I see clearly without that. Actually, I'm doing something today I haven't done for a while, and I should use my iPad to free from. I'm not often told what to preach, but I was last week. Yes, you were. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I don't want to disappoint you. And I got to thinking about it. Brother Milam will be preaching in a little while. He'll be preaching on the subject, a little word spelled I-F. I may know what that says. Yeah. 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 Um, so I had to, I thought about that a lot. Actually, I began to look at a lot of ifs in the Bible. There's a lot of ifs in the New Testament. I'll go back in the Old Testament and do that. And uh, I got to thinking this morning sometime, 2, 3, 4 o'clock this morning, about the most important if in the Bible. And uh, I'm not going to preach on it, but I was wondering if you knew what it was. So you read the Bible. How many have read the Bible? Amen. Uh, the old, at least the old, the New Testament. You read through the New Testament. Amen. How many read it more than once? Amen. How many more than twice? Yeah. How many read it fifteen times? <laughs> yeah. How many read it thirty times? Probably. <laughs> Probably. I know I've read it more times than I. I've read it enough, and here I made a decision some time ago. I may not be able to memorize it all, but I want to be familiar with it. So when somebody mentions something, I say, oh, yes. A lot of times I can finish verses I didn't think I knew because I've read it so many times. Well, I want to tell you what I think is the most important if in the Bible. We're not going to preach on it, but I, I think it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this, as, as far as you and I are concerned, there may be some others that have to do with other things. But Paul, when he wrote, and you can search for it, I'm not going to tell you what part of chapter 15 is in. But Paul wrote it and he said this, if there be no resurrection, mm -hmm. we're all, we are of all men most miserable. Mm -hmm. Amen. So the great if is on the resurrection. That means if there's no resurrection, we're wasting our time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Paul made mention of that. That's just a thought that I gave to you, but I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5, and uh, it's a wonderful book. Well, all the Bible is a wonderful book. You ever think about that? Yes. We say this and that, but all of it's wonderful. Oh, yeah. Some of it's hard for us to understand because it happened so long ago. But uh, I got to thinking about what God said to Israel many times. said, kill them all. Mm -hmm. Kill the women, kill the children, kill them all. I thought, wait, wait a minute, how, how, where's the love of God expressed in that? But it is. It's expressed. God's teaching us a lesson. Those that are, that are against him, those that will not listen, those that will not do what should do, mm -hmm. are a hindrance. And uh, God knows who they are, and he always does everything right, so we can depend on his decisions. Mm -hmm. And when he says do that, it's what you ought to do. Yeah. Well, let's read a little bit, begin in verse 5. And we'll begin in verse 1, I mean, begin in chapter 5 and verse 1. And it says this, For we know if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Yes. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from above. If so, that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore, we're always confident, knowing that whilst we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Amen. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 
that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to, to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. For whether we be beside ourselves, it's to God. Or whether it be sober, it's to, for your cause. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, if one died for all, then we're all dead. Mm. That he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Mm -hmm. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, Yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to him by himself, uh, us to himself by Christ, uh, Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and that committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God, for it made him sin to be sin, for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. I want to go back to verse 17 of our text verse today. And it's another if, therefore... If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Father, we ask your blessing today. Help us, Lord, as we look at this portion of Scripture to learn something that will draw us closer to you that will make us more like you in our daily living, that will cause us to rejoice and to praise your name and to glorify you. We do pray for those that are absent today because of an accident. We pray you'll bless and meet uh, Brother Terry's needs in a wonderful way. And may he give you honor and glory, even in that situation in the hospital. Now, I pray for Henry, Lord, you might ease the burden of his, his blood pressure, his heartbeat. And, Lord, that you'll give him peace and comfort yes, as he goes through this. Now, I pray for each one this year, many on our prayer list. We're fighting that old thing called cancer. And Lord, sometimes the prospects look dim, but if you're saved, they're very bright. Yes. Sir. Now I pray you'll comfort and meet their needs in a wonderful way. Yes. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. And amen. amen. There are two words in this short statement that are of supreme importance. There's a little word that we have already mentioned to you, the word if. It's a that word's a great separator. Usually it involves a question. However, this is not the case that's before us today. This is not a question in here. You will find no question mark at the end of this remark. This statement supposes that you have already accomplished the most important transaction in the world, and that's of being saved from the consequences of your sin. You ever think about that? You ever spend any time thinking about really what God has done for you? Oh, yeah. Does it make you appreciate him? Yes, sir. yes, sir. I think sometimes I feel like there's people who go around, they have all the words, they know all the right statements, but they really have no idea what they're talking about. Yes, sir. Not this Saturday, but last Saturday we knocked on a door and a lady came through the door and she uh, began to talk to her and she said, I'm, I have a personal relationship with the Lord, I'm saved, I'm no, I'm going to heaven. She said, but one thing I need, and, uh, and she didn't wait for me to ask what it was, she said, I should have a no soliciting uh, placard on my door. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, is that an attitude that a Christian ought to have? Someone who's been saved? No, if somebody knocks on your door and wants to give you the most precious thing you could ever get, you ought to thank them for it. Amen. Yeah. Well, I've lived for a long time. I've lived longer than my wife. Yes, the only one in here that I haven't lived longer than is probably Brother Wayne. And here's what, I, I've never had anybody knock on my door. Really? 
and tell me about Jesus. Well, I've had Jehovah's Witness come by. They don't know what they're talking about. But I've had a Christian come by and knock on my door. If they did, I wasn't home. And it's a strange thing. It's, and that's a sad commentary on the church, really, when you think about it. And uh, there ought to be someone knocked on your door. Anybody knock on your door and tell you about Jesus? Yeah, they have. that's a sad, sad commentary on the Bible-believing churches in Fort Pierce, Florida. Very sad. Now, they may have knocked on your door when you were out gallivanting around spending your money at the shopping center or something, and you weren't home. That's not their fault. But they ought to leave something at the door to let you know that they've been there. But here's, here's this statement. is that It's one, a great separator, and it talks about being saved from the consequences of your sin. But it does raise a question. And here's the question. It points to two different paths that a person may take. Two paths. There's only two. Mm -hmm. There are two clear paths that are given to us in the Word of God. The great majority of the world is on the first path. That path is a well-traveled path. The Bible says is a path that leads to destruction. That's where they're heading. It's a wide path. And the scripture says, many there be that go in thereat. That's where everybody's heading. That's where that young lady was heading yesterday when we knocked on her door. Yes, sir. Oh, thank God we knocked on, well, didn't even knock on the door. They were in the yard. Three young children. I thought they were all girls. They were all boys. <laughs> and, uh, but their hair was a little long. And they were young, very young. You couldn't tell. Yeah. Anyway, but I tell you what, they gave a clear clear testimony they were saved. Amen. They had a wonderful thing when you find somebody saved. But here's a problem. They're not churched. Yeah. They were not churched. Yeah. And what I questioned, uh, uh, the lady said, well, I grew up going to Bible Baptist Church. Oh, really? Wow. Yes. I don't think she meant this one. I think she meant well, it was the other side of town. But she grew up that way, and she said, we're kind of looking. But they were looking real hard. Well, I sicked a little on them, and then I sicked the Bible Baptist on them because they were on the same street. <laughs> what I'm saying to you, there's a lot of people that are hidden on that wide path. And, and if you look around, you, you look in the grocery store, you're in the, well, if you're with Brother Milam and you're in the movie theater oh, no. or the dance hall, and you look at the person yeah. right or left of you, well, you, you, they're on one of those two paths. You know something. Yeah. They're on the way to heaven or on their way to hell. They're they're on those two paths, and it's a, there's another path. You know something I don't know. And that's a narrow path. The Bible speaks of a narrow path. The Scripture declares it's narrow because it leads to life everlasting. Amen. And it's a choice. It's one you make personally. No one else can make it for you. You must make it yourself. Wouldn't it be nice if I could say, "Hey, I want you to be saved. You're saved now." Yes, absolutely. Can't do that. Nope. No, mom and dad can't save you. Nope. No, grandpa and grandma, they can't nope. save you. Aunt and uncle can't save you. It's a choice you must personally make. Yeah. I suppose most of us would rather be uh, on the path that leads to everlasting life. I hope you are. Uh, but, uh, and, and we don't want to go to one leads to, to that destructive thing. But you know there's people probably listen on the radio or the internet or by Facebook. They're not able to say what path they're on. They're hoping they're on the right path. They're trying to be on the path that leads to heaven. They're working hard, really, to get to there, to that path. And yesterday when I was talking to that young Catholic lady, she's 30 years old. You know, sometimes you don't have to ask, they'll tell you. When they're 30, they don't mind telling you how old they are, right? Mm -hmm. So I was about to ask her how long she'd been a Catholic, and if she had told me, I'd have known how old she was anyway. And uh, I asked her, I said, well... I said, you've been a Catholic for 30 years. I tried to turn the tables like I'd done before. And I said, could, maybe. I said, can you tell me? I said, now you've been going to church for 30 years. Could you tell me how that I can be 100% sure I'm going to heaven when I die? And that's a pretty good question to ask somebody yes, that's been to church for 30 years. Yeah. Brother, Brother Wayne was there. I think that's what I asked her, wasn't it? And, uh, and she, she started, because she told me she was going to go to heaven. She said she thought she was going to go to heaven. And she said some good things. She said, well, you know, I've trusted the, Jesus as my Savior. I said, well, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. Except they don't always mean the same thing. Because she added a little postscript to that. And she said, I'm trying to do right. Yeah. 
So right then you know it's not Jesus that's the Savior. No. It's her and Jesus that's the Savior. And that never works. Yeah. And she couldn't give me a clear way to do that, and so I told her how I got saved. Here, but there's, there's a lot of people trying to get there, but they're on the wrong path, and they're going to the path of religion. I think I've told you several times about my wife and I taking a trip to Western Maryland, up in the mountains of Western Maryland, a little place called, it's called, um, what is it called? What is it? Well, we are, yeah, Deep Creek and Swallow Falls, and, and my in-laws went with us. We had, we had a tent back in those days. We didn't have a trailer. We had a tent. We had, how many children we had? Five? Great day. I couldn't remember that. Five children in one tent and two adults. My, my in-laws, they, they pulled a little trailer about eight foot long with them. And, and so uh, when we drove in, I noticed there was a sign that had some walking paths. In it. And I, I noticed one said 20 minutes. And so the next morning, we woke up kind of early, about daybreak, and I said to my wife, and both of us could walk back then, I said, uh, hey, let's take that 20-minute walk before the kids wake up. And she agreed to do that and went over to my in-law's trailer and knocked on the door and asked him if the kids woke up to watch the kids. And so we did. We started out on that 20-minute path. Oh, we walked about 10 minutes, maybe 15. I said, let's sit down on this log right here. I said, we'll be really still. We'll see all kinds of animals. Yeah. And so we walked a little off the path and sat down on a fallen tree, and we were sitting there. I didn't even see a fly, not an <laughs> ant, no spiders, nothing. And I hate to say it. It's, too, it's a statement I hate to make. You know what it is? I guess I was wrong. Mm -hmm. I never have been wrong before. Sometimes I'm not quite right, but, but I figured I was wrong this time. So we got up to leave, and that's when we stepped back on a path, and there was a little sapling that had fallen down, and... When I stepped on a clump of bushes over here, a black bear stood up and roared. Oh. <laughs> you know, what an experience. I mean, it didn't scare me. I don't think I, I was too frightened to be scared. <laughs> I'm looking at my wife and her eyes about the biggest teacups, and mine was like dinner plates. I guess that's right. <laughs> but it roared a couple of times, dropped back down on all fours, and ran down in the bottom. And I had a hard time getting my wife to move. She didn't want to move because she figured the bear was waiting somewhere on that path. We didn't want either way. So we decided to keep on going and we walked. And we walked. Now I didn't have a wallet. I didn't have any money. I didn't have any keys. I had no identification of anything on. And we just walked and walked and walked and walked. And every step, Brother Milam, we broke a cobweb. I had a stick. And I was going like this, oh, yeah. breaking cobwebs, because yeah. nobody been down that path for a lot of years. I think. <laughs> and finally, after many hours, we walked into a clearing, and I thought we were back where we started, <laughs> got where we wanted to go. It took a little longer than we anticipated. I know my in-laws probably think we got lost, got eaten by that bear, probably. <laughs> and I noticed there was a. a Ranger's car and a couple. There's a couple walking down the clearing, and I walked up, and it was kind of hot, and he had the windows up, the air conditioner on. I knocked on the window. I said, "Sir, can you tell us, tell me how far we are from Swallow Falls?" He said, "13 miles." My <laughs> word! I said, "Well, sir, is there a better way back than the way we came to the forest?" He said, "No, sir. That's the best way back." <laughs> Man, I'm thinking another 13 miles of walking. But he took pity on us. We must have looked pretty sad at that point. He said, would you like me to drive you back? You, you know how long it took me to answer that? <laughs> and we got in there, and when I told him about it, beating that bear, I said, I told my wife not to worry, it won't bother you. He said, we've had 13 unprovoked attacks already this year. <laughs> oh, so, my boy, Lord. I'm glad I didn't know that. Amen. <laughs> but here we were on a path. We thought it was going to the place we wanted to go. Yes, sir. But we end up going to somewhere we didn't plan on. And a lot of this world is out there. That's what they're doing. Yes, it is. They're traveling the path. They think it's going to get them to heaven. But they're going to end up in hell. Yeah. Because it's the wrong path. Mm -hmm. It's just the wrong one to go. And so it's important to be on the right path. It's important. Mm -hmm. If any man, it says, if any man is in Christ, 
Uh, you, that shouldn't discourage you, women. That's a near, generic term in the Bible. means mankind. Mm -hmm. yes. So you can say if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Yep. Yes. That's a wonderful thing to be uh, in Christ. Now I want to think about that little word in. Brother Mike and I had a little discussion about something to, this week. It got so heated. Well, it wasn't angry. It was just loud. You know, sometimes you can't get somebody to understand something. You raise your voice. I don't know what that's going to do for you. <laughs> Maybe you say, you'll get, it, you'll get it in by noise. Yeah. I'm not sure. Anyhow, it was, it was loud enough. To, I would say Mrs. Buller said, I'm just going to go home and eat lunch because I can't think. <laughs> but after, after our heated discussion, we were talking. I, I was trying to use a little word. It's in this one. Look back in your text verse again. Verse 17 says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, mm -hmm. that little word in means everything. It really does. It yep. means more than you and I ever think about. Being in Christ. It's a wonderful <laughs> little word. It's, a, it, it's, it's just from two little letters. And actually, the Greek word is also two little word, two little letters. Mm -hmm. But it means so much more. It sounds wonderful. It paints a great picture. It shows our safety. I, I don't, can't do this today, but I want you to imagine my finger. And, and I'm, you're looking at my back. You didn't know that. I want you to imagine that I've turned my back on you, and there's a whiteboard behind me, and I have a black marker. And on that whiteboard, I'm going to draw a circle. And knowing my artistic capabilities, it'll be a perfect circle. Oh, my. And on the outside of that circle, I'm going to write a little Greek word. It's spelled Epsilon Nu. What? That's the word, Epsilon Nu. That's the word translated in. It has a wonderful meaning. Now I know, you and I know a little bit about in. For instance, if I would say to you, I'm in trouble, that would tell you I've got a problem, but not how big the problem was. I would say, I could be in a little trouble, or I could be in a lot of trouble. But it describes where I am. I'm in some kind of difficulty. But this word is not like that. This word, little word, epsilon nu, in, tells us exactly what's going on. You can take that little epsilon nu. How would I do that backwards? Epsilon nu and draw an arrow right into the center of that circle, and you would find out what it means. To be right in the center of that circle. Mm -hmm. To be, couldn't get any better, right in the center. And when the Bible speaks about being in Christ, it's talking about being right in the center. Yeah. Not on the periphery, Amen. not part of the way in, not yep. three quarters of the way in, but so far in, if you went any further, you'd be heading out. Mm -hmm. That's what that word means, to be in Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible said, man, that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. <clears throat> we know that, right? When you get in Christ, everything changes. It all changes. And so we're in Christ. And I, I want to illustrate that to you. Mm -hmm. Because many, many years ago, how many ever been to St. Louis, Missouri? Misery. Have you been out there? Have you been to the arch? Anybody been to the arch? Have you been under the arch? Down under the arch? Well, I learned some things. My wife and I went out there, and I learned that's a shaky experience going up to that arch. It goes like this. It's not like an elevator because it's elliptical. And when you get up there, it's not really wide. It's probably as wide as these chairs right here. And you get you can see Bush Stadium on one side. And Mississippi River on the other side. But underneath I learned more than I did on top. Because I had some exhibits there. And one of the exhibits I saw was a Conestoga wagon. Anybody see a Conestoga yeah. wagon? Yes, sir. How many know what that is? Yeah. Yeah. You've seen him. If you ever watch a Western uh -huh. on TV, you see John Wayne. He's uh -huh. riding on a Conestoga wagon and somebody comes and shoots him off. And they turn it over and fight the Indians from behind it. That's the kind of stood away. Uh -huh. What I didn't know is why it had such big wheels. 
they had the big wheels so that when riding out through the plains, they would be above the grass. They'd be higher than the grass around them. And I read about this wagon train. I think Brother Wayne might have been on it. But I read about this wagon train and it was going across the plains in the middle of that grass. And when they looked around them, they realized there was something strange. They were surrounded by fire, a ring of fire all around them. And uh, it was racing toward them. And there's no way for them to escape the fire. But the wagon master was a wise man. He'd been there before. So he gathered all the men together. He pulled all the wagons together. He got all the cattle and brought them together in a little spot. And he started another fire. And he controlled the fire. And they burned another spot. And when it got large enough for all the cattle and all the wagons to get in, he moved everybody inside that. And that old fire that was outside kept raging and raging toward them and raging. And it looked like they were done for. But when it got to the place they burned, it went out. Amen. And they were saved. <laughs> They were saved because the fire had already been there yeah. and done its best. You see, many years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ took that outraged law of God and his sentence and was beaten and crucified to satisfy the penalty of sin. The Bible said, and we read it, for he hath made him to be sin for us. Actually, if you leave the italicized words out, they were added by the translators. It says, for he was made sin for us. Mm -hmm. Who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He took your place and my place and died on the cross of Calvary. And when you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, and what he did on the cross of Calvary to be sufficient to have paid for your sin, you are placed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Notice our text first. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, Amen. you're placed in him. And because you are in Christ, you're in the place of safety because God's judgment has already fallen on him and can't come again. That's a wonderful little place to be in the safety of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, that's, that's why I know I'm going to heaven. Because my sins paid for. And now I'm in Christ. And because it's already fallen on him, it can't fall on me. I've been insulated from that. It's a wonderful thing. Amen. But I want you to notice what happens when you're in Christ. You can write this down. The first thing happens that you're a new creature. Yep. You're not the same anymore. It always puzzled me when someone says I'm a Christian, but they don't live like it. There's no evidence. I always said if you, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Right. Yeah. Well, you don't need a whole lot of evidence, but there's, there, you're going to be a new creature, the Bible said. There's something going to be new. It's going to be new. It doesn't say you'll be, a, it doesn't say you'll be renovated. It's very emphatic. You'll be new. There's no doubt about it. When you're an in crowd, you're spanking brand new. Amen. Now, that's not reformation. A lot of people are trying to reform. We have reformed schools. I probably should have been in one. <laughs> Babe Ruth went to one. Yeah. I know where it is. I've been beside it. Our oldest child was born across the street from where he went to reform school. The, the hole in the glass where he threw that ball back through. It's not there anymore. No, I don't know if the building's still there right now. But you're brand new. A new creature, not something renovated, not something reformed. It means to be exactly brand new. I, I, I looked that up in the dictionary. Webster says it this way, lately made, invented, produced or came into being that has existed a short time only, recent in origin, uh, novel, Opposed to old, use the things as a new coat, a new house, a new book, a new fashion, a new theory, a new chemistry, a new discovery. That means it's new, brand new. Uh, you, 
you see, you can't reform what we have. You can't make it over. The old man can't be made over because it's totally depraved. Totally depraved. It can't be repaired. It's unrepairable. You see, if you read the Bible, some of you do, you read Isaiah chapter 1, verse 6, you'll read about a nation. Isaiah wrote about his nation. And what he said about his nation went for the individuals of that nation. And here's what he said about his nation. He said, from the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there's no, sound, no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They've not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with oil. He says, totally useless. That's what we were. Or you get saved, that's exactly where we are. So you see, but when you get saved, God makes a difference. Amen. Things become new when you're in Christ. It makes a different person out of you. Some of that was mentioned in Sunday school this morning. You know, before you get saved, you're a child of Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. That's what Jesus would say. Uh, you're of your father, the devil. Uh, that's what the scripture says. But now, once you're saved, you're no longer a child of Satan. You're a child of God. There's a complete difference in that. You were a slave of sin. You couldn't help but sin. We get all upset about sin. You ever notice how Christians get upset about somebody who sins? Well, how could they do that? Well, they're sinners. They're not sinners because they sin. They're sinners because that's their nature. I said to that young woman who had four children, I said, you don't have to teach your children how to lie. Did you have to teach them how to lie? No. Well, how come you don't have to teach them how to lie? Because that's their nature. That's an, you have your father, the devil. And he was, the Bible said he was a liar from the beginning. He's a father of lies. Yeah, you don't have to teach people to do evil. It's natural. Uh, it wasn't for laws. Uh, we'd be in really big trouble. We are anyhow because they're not doing much with the laws. They're on the books. Amen. But now you're a child of God. You're a slave to sin, but now you're made free from sin. You don't have to. You were full of pride and wrath. But now you ought to be meek and humble. You live for this world. And now you ought to live and please God. That will be a change in your life. If there's been no change, most likely there's been no salvation. Yeah. When a man saves, he's different. Amen. It may be a small change or a big change, but there's always going to be a change. Yes, sir. Some of our friends down in Virginia, we just went there for my brother-in-law's funeral. There's family in their church. They got saved sometimes just a couple weeks, I think, before I did. And their name was Fallon. They were good people, moral people, church people. They went to church all the time. They prayed. They prayed together as a family. They read the scripture together. They tied their income. They did everything that you would think that a saved person ought to do. But guess what? It was lost as you could possibly be. So when they got saved, there wasn't a great, big, observable change in their life. There was a change. Here's what the change was. Now what they were doing is because they're going to heaven, not because they want to go. And now they can tell how Jesus saved them from their sin, and before they couldn't do that. Amen. So it could be a large change. When you look at me, there was a big change in my life. My wife sitting here, she'll tell you, she didn't recognize me the next day. I wasn't the same guy. I mean, I looked the same. I was just as ugly as ever was. But I wasn't the same. I mean, when I woke up that morning, my eyes, I, everything looked different to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, our house looked better. Yeah. Sure. I mean, the grass was greener. Amen. The sky was bluer. Yeah, yeah. The weather was perfect. Uh-huh. I mean, everything was. That's yeah. it. And I got my car. I had, I had a great car. Mm -hmm. A little Volkswagen bug, you can call that great. <laughs> and I remember taking that old Bible that my mother gave me when I was 21 and laying on a steering wheel and reading the Bible all the way to work. I mean, even work was better. I sang all day yeah, long. Can you imagine me singing in a plant full of people? Amen. Uh -huh. The only thing that was Amen. salvation in that was they had high-speed belts. You couldn't hear me. I'd have to get up in your ear and yell and for you to hear me. Shortest day ever worked in my life. Why did that happen? Because I was new. 
Amen. I never had that kind of happiness before. I never had that kind of peace before. It all came because I said, yes, Jesus, yes, I'm a sinner. Amen. I need to be saved. I'm thinking you to be my amen. Lord and Savior. And everything changed. Bless the Lord. And it's never gone back the other way. That's right. Oh, somebody said, well, you know, we have a sinful nature. No, 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 not when you get saved. No, I know. You know I know this. I don't like to sing that song, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I don't like that. I mean, I looked through this whole New Testament. I can't find any statement like that. I read this morning the book of Colossians. You know what Paul said? He wrote it to the church at Colossae. You know what he said? To the saints. Yes, sir. Yes, and the brethren. He didn't say to the sinners. He said to the saints. My wife said, you ain't no saint. Yes, I am. <laughs> God said so. Amen. Yeah. We're not sinners. We're saints. And it goes, I mean, you know, I don't like that. Well, I sing it. I was just, I was a sinner saved by grace. Amen. Not I am a sinner saved by grace. Because in God's eyes, you're not a sinner anymore. You're, you're as holy as Jesus is. Because where are you? You're in Jesus. He sees you and I through Jesus. He sees us as perfect as his son. Isn't that a wonderful thought? It makes no difference about the rest of that. Well, I know we live in a body that's capable of sin. But we oughtn't give in to it. And God doesn't want us to. Somebody says, well, how, how can you make sure you don't? Well, it's simple. You know how to make sure you don't? Well, let me see. We have any dog lovers here? Oh, thank the Lord I can speak yeah. freely then. Oh, wait a minute, got one. I'm <laughs> two. Okay, I'll still speak freely. I love dogs. I will say this about the dogs. The Bible does speak about dogs. Mm -hmm. It calls Gentiles dogs. That was a put down. And the Bible says, don't bring the price of a dog to the temple. That's all I remember reading about the greatest statement I learned in the Bible about dogs goes like this. Dead dogs don't bark. <laughs> yeah. That's true. So suppose suppose you had a few other dogs. That we were down in Mexico. Some, well, we, me and a few other fellows. And uh, we ran across a fellow. His name is Pedro. Pedro had raised fighting dogs. Mm -hmm. that was, that's how he made a living, fighting dogs. He, he put them in a ring, trying to let them kill each other, see which one outlasts the other. That's bad. So, you know, Pedro, he knew something. He knew how to make, he knew how to make his dog win. He knew how to make a dog lose. You know how to make them? What would you do if you had that kind of thing and you wanted one dog to win, the other one to lose? How would you, how would you do that? Train them? No. Starve. No, it's easy. Feed the one you want to win. Starve the one you want to lose. It's a simple little process. And if you're going to live like a new creature, you need to starve the old man yes, and sir. feed the new man. Yeah, and you'll go on and you'll be on the winning <laughs> side like, like uh, Dr. Milam sings Amen. about. I, I heard about Dr. Malone talk about cheap cats. I don't, I'm not a cat lover. No. They make great tennis rackets. <laughs> Strange. <but. laughs> oh, oh, I'd, have a, I'd have a cat if I had mice, you know. We, we did get a cat when I was growing up because we had some mice and my, my mother borrowed a cat from one of our one of her friends and we got up the next morning there were seven kittens we didn't plan on that <laughs> that same night you know. yeah. <laughs> anyhow I learned something about cats we ought to have unity I believe we ought to be unity mm -hmm. un, 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 unity is more than just being together and you can prove that with two cats if you tie their tails together, hang them over a clothesline. You'll have unity, but you uh, you'll have union, but you won't have any unity. <laughs> that was great. You know oh, that. So well, animals are great, great illustrations. But I tell you, there's more to it than just having a change in your nature. There's a change in your outlook. Amen. Things look different. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all <laughs> things are become new. Before you're saved, everything you look at. You look at that from man's perspective. Mm -hmm. Surrounding man. Everything wrapped around man. Yeah. It's what we call humanism. See, humanism is any system or mode of thought or action 
in which human interests, values, and dignity predominate. That's humanism. We were all humanists before we got saved. Yep. You see, it's a distorted view because man is distorted in his thinking and that because of sin. And sin is a blinder. Sin blinds you. It blinds the eyes of those that are without Christ. That's what the scripture says. It says, but if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine mm -hmm. unto them. But after you're saved, your eyes are open. Mm -hmm. yes. You begin to see everything in the light of God's wonderful word. Yes. You see, I already told you what happened to me that day after I got saved, late at night, after a church service, after having a snack and so on. But really, it's hard to describe how much a change there is. Amen. Everything was different. The word of God became precious to me. I hated it before that. I don't want to hear what the Bible said. But after I got saved, I want to know what it said. Yes, sir. You see, everything changes. And it changes because the light of the Word of God mm -hmm. and the light of Jesus shines in your life. And old things are passed away. That means guilt is gone. Do you know you have a guilt complex? When you're guilty, you're running. When I was a, a teenage boy, I used to smoke. Can you tell? <coughs> I always wonder how in the world could my mother tell me tell I smoked. I mean, nobody in our house smoked. But after I quit smoking, I realized I could smell it two blocks away. Now, yeah. I don't <laughs> Anyhow, I was I was a I was a bad teenage boy, and uh, I stand alongside of a little strip mall at the Bobby Hill Cross from the Fire Department where I used to pick my papers up, and I was smoking with my buddies. About the time. My dad was coming home from work. I never thought about him ever driving by there, but I mean, he drove that way every day. And while I'm puffing on a cigarette, <laughs> sucking my brains out, here he came right on by. Uh -oh. I saw all my, I've been caught. Well, I said to myself, you ever talk to yourself? Uh -huh. Don't take yourself's advice. I said to myself, you know, I'm already in trouble. I may as well stay out until I got to go home. <laughs> and I did. I missed dinner. I missed all the stuff that went on in the house. I knew when I went home, my dad was going to take me down to the basement. Mm -hmm. I never liked going to the basement with my dad because <laughs> I knew something was going to happen. Yeah. He was going to talk to you. He's big around as I am. His belt was about what mine is, about six feet long. And we had a little pole held the first floor up, and we took a little jog around that pole. I ran as hard as I could, tried to outrun, outrun that belt, never could. I knew that's what waited me. But I went home finally, I had to go home. And when I walked in the house, I heard these words. Where you been? Uh -huh. I says out with the boys. Oh, you missed dinner? Yes, ma'am, I wasn't hungry. Lie number one. Uh -huh. Well, Ain't nothing left for you to eat. And I went to bed. My dad didn't see me. He never saw me, Brother Tom. <laughs> I thought he saw me, but he never saw me. I guilty. missed that on dinner. Guilty. I went through a whole evening worried about it, feeling guilty. I was upset I was going to get it really what I deserved when I got home. But I, I guess what? He never saw me. I will say this. God doesn't miss anything. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. His whipping post is not down the basement around a pole. That's right. It's much worse than that. Yeah. But when I got saved, I had to worry about meeting God in anger. Amen. Not hear him say, you dirty rat, take that. <laughs> He's not going to say that to me. No. He just put his loving arms around me. The guilt is gone. You see, the Bible says that all the world should become guilty before God. But when you get saved, the guilt is gone. I'll tell you something else is gone. Fear is gone. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm getting kind of near the end of life. So are you. Yeah. yeah. I think about it just about every day. 
And I, I know saying something's going to kill me. Either the trumpet's going to blow or something's going to kill me. I always wonder, what is it going to be? Maybe that's it, that little thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's this here. It's me because my knees hurt. You never know. You really don't know. Something. Maybe it won't be, be like my father-in-law. Just had heart skip beats once in a while, and one day just decided to stop beating altogether. He sat down, he was gone. There wasn't any pain involved in it. But you know what? It didn't make any difference. No, it doesn't. Because I know where I'm going. Amen. I know what's going to happen. I think we read something about that even in this little portion of the Word of God about being with Christ. It's far better to be absent from the body be present with the Lord. Amen. That's why I can't get upset about people dying that are saved. Oh, I feel bad for those left behind. I feel bad for a wife who's been married for 100 years or 30 years or 40 years or 10 years because that's a cutting of the flesh. It's a separation. Yes, sir. And there's pain involved for her, but not for the departed one. He's doing much better or she's doing much better. And there ought to be rejoicing. You know why I know that? Because the Bible seems to speak that way. Amen. Paul said it. It's better yes, sir. to die and be with Christ. It's better. Well, so fear is gone. Thank God that we can have peace with God. Romans 5, 1 says, Here, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. My question is simply this. Are you in Christ? Some listening by radio, maybe by internet, and they're not sure. And if you're not sure, you're not saved. It's a simple thing. Yeah. Because when, you know, if I said, who's your mama and daddy, most of you could tell me who they were. Yeah. You knew who they were. And, and, and you'd say, well, why are they your mother and father? You, you could give a good answer because my mother gave birth to me. Yes. I, I'm a, you know, I'm part of the family. And when you get saved, it's a new birth. You know about it. This happens at a certain point in time. You ought to be more sure about your spiritual birth than you were about your fleshly birth because I don't remember any of that. Now, I believe my mother, she was there. I take her word for it. Right? <clears throat> oh, look at some of my children. I think, well, who their father was? I'm not sure. <laughs> they don't look like me. <clears throat> but are you in Christ? Do you know for sure you're in Christ? Have you trusted him with all your heart? Then uh, are you a new person? Are you a new man? And then final question is this. Which one are you feeding? Which one do you feed the most? Uh, which is, it, is it that old man that you feed? I mean, there's so much pressure from outside. Everywhere you look, there's something. You look at TV and they have the advertising. Well, we, we look a we watch a little bit of uh, broadcast TV. But normally when the advertisement comes on, I turn the sound off. I do. Because you know, it's lies. It's nothing but lies. Mm -hmm. It's all lies. I mean, there's no truth. There used to be a thing called truth in advertising. Where did it go? There's no truth in advertising. You see some person doing something that's out ridiculous and they talk, well, that's a way to have fun. No. There's no fun in that. You smoke this cigarette and you'll turn into springtime. That's what one they used to have. I keep remember that. Whoever smoked a cigarette and was in living in winter and all of a sudden it was springtime. Mm -hmm. Stupid stuff. No, you smoke that cigarette and you'll turn into dust because it'll kill you. Smoke, smoke, smoke that cigarette. Smoke, smoke, smoke till you smoke yourself to death. You ever read that? It's an old song. But it's true. It's true. You see, the one you feed is going to be one that wins. You all learn to feed the right one. Feed. We've got good fodder. Here it is. Amen. The Word of God. Amen. You can learn everything you need to know by reading the Word of God. Yes, sir. You can learn how to count by reading the Word of God. Right. You ever think about that? Yeah. It, it, because it's number. You can learn a lot of things just by reading the Word of God. 
Now, if you read the book of Concordance, you might get messed up, but the rest of it's pretty good. Read the Bible. Be the right one. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. It's almost lunchtime. Time to eat. Which one are you feeding? Suppose the Lord answered that for you. What would be the answer? We, we live in a blessed time. When Paul pen, penned this letter, not everybody had the Word of God. They didn't have a Bible like we do. They couldn't go home and open their book and read. They had to go somewhere else to hear about it. But you and I, we have it. it it's a wonderful book. And you ought to learn it. You ought to read it. Read it. And learn what God wants you to do with it. I wonder with head bowed and eyes closed. I need to ask this question. Are you sure that you're saved? Have you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart? Are you 100% sure? I wonder today with head bowed and eyes closed. Now I know most of you. I've asked it before, but I want to make sure. With head bowed and eyes closed, is there one or more say, Preacher, I'm not sure. I want to be sure. <clears throat> but deep down in my heart, there's doubt. I'm not sure. And if my life were taken from me today, I'm not sure I'd be going to spend eternity with the Lord. Is anyone like that with head bowed and eyes closed? They lift their hands and say, pray for me that I'd be sure. All right. Are you reading the Word of God? Are you feeding the new man? How many say, preacher, I believe I'm feeding the new man. I believe I am. Can I see your hands if that's your belief? I believe I'm feeding the new man. God bless you. If you couldn't raise your hand, you ought to say in your seat or somewhere else. I'm going to start feeding the new man. I'm going to start feeding on the word of God. Father, we ask your blessing. Lord, all of us have failed. All of us are weak. The flesh is weak. You said it yourself. Many times we make promises. Many times we make decisions and we're not able to carry them out because we're dependent on the flesh. So I pray today for those who could not lift their hands, say they're feeding a new man, that you would help them. You would encourage them. You would remind them. Help us to learn something as we not just read your word, but meditate on it. Ruminate on it. Chew on it a little bit till we get something to strengthen our day. Help us be more like you. I pray you meet the needs of those who may be listening by other means. Some who need to be saved. It's, I'm sure that's true. Many who need to be strengthened. Help us to determine to be what you'd have us to be. Mm -hmm. Let's stand together with head bowed and eyes closed.